Hello everyone, I'm back, I'm doing very well and I've just finished my third year of university which, despite being tremendous fun, was also so much work that I just haven't had the time to keep making these videos which, I hope you can appreciate, take several hours of my time. However, I'm going to be free over the summer period to start making videos again. So let's get started. So a while ago I made a video explaining how applying anarchist thinking consistently leads you to feminist conclusions. Here I'm going to take the same core position, anarchist feminism, but viewed from a slightly different angle in terms of showing what anarchist feminism offers when compared with liberal feminism and radical feminism in terms of the consistency of the ideas and the effectiveness of addressing different systems of oppression that affect people's lives. The point of this is not only to illustrate why I think anarchist feminism is the best feminism, but also to show that there are so many different schools of thought with really contrasting ideas that all call themselves feminist. And therefore, if you're going to criticise feminism without being a dickhead, you have to be aware of these contrasting schools. So let's start with radical feminism. Now, a lot of people use the term radical feminists to describe any feminist that happens to hold views that they disagree with or that fall outside of the mainstream liberal window of acceptable opinion. However, radical feminism is a specific ideology which emerged in the US around the 1960s. The rad femme positions that I'm going to be talking about today are TERFs, SWERFs and kink shamers. TERF is an initialism standing for Trans-Exclusionary Radical Feminist. TERFs view gender as if it is a binary and determined by reproductive anatomy. This view of gender is shared by the existing society, which assigns people with a gender identity at birth, male or female, depending on reproductive anatomy, although this doesn't apply for intersex people whose reproductive anatomy is often forcibly operated on in order to meet the gendered criteria. The problem with this is that not everybody necessarily agrees with the gender that they were assigned at birth and not everybody fits into the binary model. Given that trans and gender queer people exist, gender is more about what's inside your head than what you have physically. Just like sexuality is a broad and varied spectrum, so is gender identity. Although gender identity is independent of sexuality and what you have physically. A feminism which doesn't account for all of this excludes trans people. It's not just the case that TERFs don't account for trans people in their gender analysis, but they actively antagonise trans people. For example, prominent TERF Kathy Brennan collaborated with the Pacific Justice Institute, a religious right-wing ex-gay organisation which promotes conversion therapy, among other hideous practices, in trying to smear a transgender teenage girl whom the PGI baselessly claimed without evidence to be harassing cisgender girls in school bathrooms. Naturally, the right jumped all over this without fact-checking, going, Ah, you see, trans people really are out to get you, and Kathy Brennan followed suit. After being publicly humiliated in this manner, the trans girl was later revealed to be on suicide watch. This case of collaboration with the religious right, which historically has been no friend of feminism, illustrates the reactionary nature of TERFs as a tendency. They prey on irrational fears of trans people and hold really bizarre views, like the idea that trans women are actually men who want to enter female-only spaces and commit rape, or the idea that trans men are actually women with inferiority complexes. These views are ridiculous, bigoted, they have no basis in fact or evidence, and therefore no place in a movement which calls itself feminist. Trans people exist, grow the fuck up and get over it already. In terms of the warning signs, TERFs tend not to openly identify as trans-exclusionary, instead opting to swan about calling themselves gender-critical with no apparent sense of irony, given that they subscribe to a cis-normative view of gender which is held up by the existing patriarchal society. Gender-critical indeed. Given that tariffs come out of the second wave, second wave politics are the ones that you've generally got to watch out for. Political lesbian separatists, women born women, and so on, these people are tariffs. Let's move on to SWERFs. SWERF stands for Sex Worker Exclusionary Radical Feminist, which, as the name suggests, is another second wave radfem offshoot. 
Swerfs oppose women's participation in porn and the sex industry. Now, there are a great many valid criticisms to be made of the way that these institutions function in a patriarchal, capitalist society. However, Swerfs support the criminalisation of sex work as a means of addressing these issues. This is a problem, because it means that sex workers who are abused and assaulted have no way of coming forward and reporting it, given that their line of work itself is criminalised. The police are more concerned with stopping the sale of sex than they are with stopping the abuse of people selling sex. In my opinion, that's a morally repugnant position. Sex workers therefore typically support the decriminalisation of sex work and organised labour as a means of protecting their interests economically and their well-being. Any effort to eradicate the abuses that occur in the sex industry ought to be led by those who are most affected, the sex workers. Swerfs don't listen to the policies that these people advocate and yet claim to speak on their behalf, which is a huge problem. Furthermore, there are all sorts of reasons why some people might take up sex work. People aren't always trafficked, and some people take it up voluntarily. And yet, Swerfs continuously talk about sex work in terms of inherent tragedy, which is just a blunt instrument approach to a much more complex issue. In my opinion, people have the right to survive capitalism by any means necessary. Sex work is work, grow the fuck up, and get over it already. Let's move on to kink shamers, who, as the name suggests, shame people for having kinks. In the context of feminism, these will typically be swerfy rad femmes who claim that BDSM is abusive, that it eroticizes women's oppression, and that submissive women only enjoy it because of patriarchy. There is an avalanche of problems with this. Firstly, the idea that BDSM inherently involves an exercise of men's power over women is heteronormative and gender essentialist. It's erasive of the fact that BDSM can also take place in, for example, queer relationships where men and women aren't involved. So the gender binary is not a requirement of BDSM, and gender identities in general is, are not a requirement of having particular desires for certain physical and emotional experiences. People of all sorts of gender identities can have all sorts of desires. Even in a heterosexual context, that doesn't necessarily entail dominant men and submissive women. Secondly, the charge of eroticizing women's oppression ignores the distinction between sexuality and sensuality. Just as a massage can be enjoyed in both a sexual and a non-sexual setting, so can BDSM. While it's often erotic, it's not exclusively so, and can also be enjoyed in an asexual context. BDSM done properly takes place with an overall framework of negotiation and consent, through preliminary discussion of soft and hard limits, and safe words to use to indicate when a given limit has been crossed. The point at which an act becomes non-consensual is the point at which it becomes abusive. If you think that BDSM is inherently abusive, you either don't know what abuse is, or you don't know how to do BDSM properly. Both of these are likely in a society such as ours, with really poor sexual education and really poor examples of BDSM in the media, such as Fifty Shades of Grey, which are horrendously inaccurate and just set a really bad example for people. Finally, to address the notion that submissive women only enjoy it because of patriarchy, the above criticisms of heteronormativity and gender essentialism apply, and also this ignores the fact that BDSM practitioners experience pleasant altered psychological states, top space and subspace, and experience positive mental health outcomes as a result of this. So there's a human need being met here, and I think to reduce that human need, to purely an effect of some unjust system of oppression is careless, lacking in nuance, and deeply patronising. The fact that yes means yes is as important to good sexual politics as the fact that no means no. In a nutshell, some people have kinks, grow the fuck up and get over it already. So we've looked at TERFs, SWERFs, and kink shamers, a delightful package of shit politics. Given that these conclusions are shit, ideas which necessarily lead to these conclusions are shit by extension. If these conclusions follow from peripheral ideas within Radfem, then the core can be left intact. But if they follow from the core, then Radfem can be swiftly disposed of. 
With that said, let's move on to the Liberals. To give credit where credit is due, some Liberals actually sometimes have stronger sexual and gender politics than certain people in the radical left, such as members of the shambolic, decaying and increasingly irrelevant Socialist Workers' Party of the UK, who dismiss concerns over sexism within their organisation as divisive. There are a great many people on the radical left who assume that by abolishing capitalism we therefore eliminate things like patriarchy by default. I am not one of those people. My position is that if we want to build a better society we have to have radical class politics alongside liberatory sexual and gender politics. Herein lies the trouble with liberalism, which lacks decent class politics. People typically spend a big chunk of their waking lives in the workplace, and if you have an interest in building a free society, it really matters that the workplace is a domain of freedom. If you have a capitalist economy, then the workplace will be organised in the profit interests of a small minority of private owners who own the workplace rather than the majority of people who are actually doing the work. Even though the conditions of workers in one capitalist business may be comparatively better than the conditions of those in another, what doesn't change is the fact that both are predicated on serving the interests of an elite minority and a chain of command from top to bottom. How is this conceivably in the interests of freedom and democracy? Whether you're giving or receiving orders in this system matters hugely to the allocation of resources and the degree of control that you have over your life. For the Liberal, this sort of class analysis is non-existent. A typical example is everyday feminism. Now due credit should be given for the regular production of easily accessible user-friendly web content, that's something that radicals should be doing. However, the perspectives on class given in everyday feminism just exemplify the problem with so-called centre-left class politics. Let me just read you a couple of short quotes from an article to illustrate this problem. We don't know poor people's lives. We don't know where they come from, who they are, or what their lives are like. Notice that this is talking about poor people in the third person and very, very distantly. It's saying, oh, we're not poor. The idea of being poor is totally alien to us, but all the same, you know, we shouldn't judge those poor people. We should have some perspective. It's not a politics of working class self-empowerment. It's a politics of middle class people patting each other on the back for feeling pity, which is useless and uninspiring. Just to clear up any confusion for liberals watching this, the working class is from planet Earth and comprises the bulk of the human species. There is no one poverty narrative. There is no one type of poor person. There is no one consistent set of experiences that apply to poor people, no matter what our classist culture tells us. Yes, there is. The working class is united through lack of ownership of capital, such as factories, workplaces, farms, offices, etc. The common principle is that we have nothing to sell but our ability to work, and therefore members of the working class have to survive under capitalism through wage labour or claiming welfare. The working class isn't some distant group of aliens that have it particularly bad under the system, but is in fact a far-reaching great mass of people that have a common dispossession of capital. While a junior doctor and a mechanic have very different lifestyles, they do take place within a common economic framework. Not only is the working class far-reaching and varied, but it produces everything necessary for the functioning of society. Understanding class in this way is far more useful to the political project of making the workplace a domain of freedom than the perspectives on class offered by the Liberals. Did you do these six activities today? Then you've got class privilege, which includes if you called in sick for work. For a lot of full-time salaried workers, calling in sick is a matter of picking up the phone. But for some workers, waking up sick means going to work sick. The right not to be made to work when you're too ill to do so is the most basic human principle. For workers to claim that right requires direct action to put the employing class under pressure and force it as a concession. The Liberal ignores this, instead opting to make other workers check their privilege for exercising the most elementary human right. 
Meanwhile, the real economic power exercised by the bosses is left unquestioned, despite the fact that that is where the power really lies in the capitalist economic system. And that's what we have to question if we really want class justice. And it's not just a case of making bosses check their privilege, it's a case of getting rid of them altogether, because their very existence is contrary to principles of freedom and equality. We can conceive of a society in which, for example, men exist as equal with all other gender identities. And a part of the realisation of that society will be men re-examining their behaviour and questioning their roles in different institutions, such as the home, workplaces, etc. Class is different. We cannot conceive of a society in which bosses and workers exist as equal because, by definition of what they are, they aren't equal. The Liberal ignores this. There are a number of reasons why anti-capitalist class justice is important to feminism. One of which is that capitalism and patriarchy are interconnected systems which form a singular entity, capitalist patriarchy, which defines how both of these oppressive systems affect people's lives. For example, I know working class women who have been sexually harassed by their bosses. This is an exercise of patriarchal violence, but also an exercise of economic violence, given that it takes place within an unequal relation of boss and worker. The liberal feminist perspective only understands the gendered component. It doesn't give us a means of understanding the class component, and therefore provides insufficient means of understanding the problem completely. Similarly, and this is also important, a socialist perspective, which understands the class violence taking place, but not the gendered violence taking place, is also insufficient. If we want to have a more complete understanding of this event, we need to have both the class component and the gender component. The liberal feminist perspective also fails to understand the role that capitalism and the state play in the perpetuation of white supremacy, oppressing people of colour through, for example, political and economic colonialism. The rape of a working class woman of colour in El Salvador by US soldiers, whose military might is deployed in order to serve the interests of large multinational corporations, is a multifaceted event. There is a gendered component, a white supremacist component, a status component and a capitalist component. Liberal feminists ignore this, which leads to problems such as supporting Hillary Clinton on the grounds of having a woman as president, which ignores the historic role that the US presidency and the American capitalist state as a whole has played in the perpetuation of white supremacy and patriarchy, which from a feminist perspective is clearly wrong. What's affecting people's lives is the sum total of lots of different systems of oppression coming together to form the society in which we live and culminating in multifaceted experiences of oppression. If we want to stop these experiences from happening, then we have to understand the sum total of systems of oppression. Now, let's have a look at the anarchist perspective. We start by adopting a generalised opposition to all unjustifiable social hierarchy. If a given social hierarchy can be justified, then it should be dismantled through the autonomous action of those at the bottom of said hierarchy and replacing the hierarchy with non-hierarchical free associations. This is the central point of anarchism, which seeks no rulers. It follows from this core anarchist principle of non-hierarchy that unjustifiable systems such as patriarchy, transphobia, queerphobia, white supremacy, capitalism and the state should all be dismantled through the autonomous action of the people affected by these systems. These different oppressive systems come together and culminate in a sum total which forms the society in which we live, leading to the different injustices that have been described in this video, such as the public smearing of that trans girl, the abuse of sex workers, the sexual harassment of working class women, the overall dispossession of the working class from the means of production, and the hideous political and economic colonialism which oppresses people of colour across the globe, and so on and so forth. If we take the anarchist perspective, we're recognising what each of these different circumstances have in common, which is that they are all manifestations of unjustifiable hierarchy. 
And by opposing that common principle as a rule, we have a more effective means of addressing the sum total of oppressions that are forming the society in which we live and affecting people's lives. This is why anarchist feminism is better than liberal feminism and radical feminism by several orders of magnitude. Because you're not just being selective about, I'm opposed to oppression in this circumstance or that circumstance, you're opposed to oppression as a rule. This has been Libertarian Socialist Rants. If you want to learn more about anarchist feminism, I highly recommend checking out Anarcho Pack's playlist on the subject titled Feminism and Identity Politics, which has a lot of really clear and concise informative videos discussing these different arguments and perspectives. Also, I've started a Patreon page, so if you would like to fund these activities and to help support me as a creator, I would really appreciate a donation of any size to help my subsistence and give me more time to work on these videos. Thank you very much for watching. Bye-bye.